And Netanyahu Shah was talking to experimental mass seminar, and another Netanyahu Shah, possibly the same, was talking to defense uh, seminar. Uh, so, uh, after the public part, which lasts 48 minutes, there will be a, a private part only for the committee, and then everybody else will be asked uh, politely to uh, live and wait until the decision is made. Thanks, and thanks to the other members of the committee, especially Barb, who's come from quite a ways to be here. So, I'm going to talk about. There, my, so, my thesis has several chapters which are tied together by the methods used rather than by the content. And I've actually talked about one of these chapters at this seminar before. I'm going to talk, I'm going to focus here on the, on the final chapter of the thesis, which is about permutation, permutations avoiding repeating patterns. And in order to, the first thing I'm going to do is show you what this is all about. And I'm going to sort of back into the normal theory of permutation patterns in kind of a different direction from what it's, the way it's normally approached. So we've had a lot of talks here this year that are to start with defining what a permutation is and what a pattern is and what it means to avoid a pattern. But I'm going to do that a little differently. So I have slides. And to Dr. Z's chagrin, this is not me writing on the blackboard, but at least there are no words on the slides. <laughs> um, so this is so permutation is a list of the numbers one through n in any order. And it's nice to be able to draw graphs of these permutations. So this graph represents the permutation 1, 3, 4, 2. So this is um, 1, 3, 4, 2, being first line, third line, fourth line, second line. So, all right, so this is one of 24 permutations of four elements, and I'm going to add one more element to it. I'm going to do that by sticking it in between two existing elements in the horizontal direction and also in the vertical direction. Um, so I'll say I've added this at position 3, 3. So notice there are squares that I can put it in, and this is a column. So I'll put it 3 on the horizontal axis and 3 on the vertical axis, so 3, 3. And then, of course, this is a new element of the permutation, and if I draw a new line through it, I get something that looks like this. So this is what I mean by inserting an element into a permutation, and that's fundamentally what I'm going to be doing a lot of. Now, of course, there are many ways to insert an element into that permutation. Uh, an, an exercise for the reader, there are 25 of them. It's not a very hard exercise. Um, so here is another way to insert an element, and that results in this permutation. So I got different permutations. Here's another way to insert an element, and I got this permutation. And now notice that we have something going on here, because this way and this way of inserting an element actually resulted in the same permutation, this one. So there, are, so there are 25 ways to insert an element, but you don't get 25 permutations out of it. So how many permutations do you get out of it? Uh, so I will do this on the board. Written that. Oh, okay. Well, there's actually one lonely piece of talk. Start on the So, I want to prove the following. Uh, I'll call it a theorem. And this is not my original theorem. This is very, very standard. And it seems to go back to Pratt in 1973, but actually I'm not sure anyone really knows how far back it goes, because probably lots of people have discovered this independently. So it is, there are, you can get, or let me, let me, there are, if they're given permutation, a permutation pi in Sn, Sn is the group, but in, I don't care about the group structure, it's just the set of all permutations of n elements. Given pi and Sn, there are n plus one, n squared plus one permutations in Sn plus 
one that can be obtained by adding one element. Inserting one element. So, if you study permutation patterns or have attended one of the many talks here on permutation patterns, you may recognize this as permutations in S n plus one that contain the pattern pop. So, there's pattern. It's the same notion of pattern that, that everyone else is using, but I'm approaching it a little differently than the other talks we've had here do it. So. I'm going to prove this. Notice that if I didn't say there, are, if I didn't count, if the same permutation is the same, there would be n squared plus two n plus one. So so every talk should have an actual proof in it. So this is going to be my actual proof. Um, so I'm going to define the permutation pi i j. as the permutation where I insert the new element in the i row, or sorry, the i column i in the horizontal axis and j on the vertical axis. So by inserting, to say that more succinctly, inserting j in position. So all 25, or n squared plus 2n plus 1, ways of doing this are described by pi i, pi j for some i and j. But since some of them are going to be equivalent, and that's what we want to look at. So I will define, so here, i, j is called redundant if there exists another pair, i prime, j prime, with, well, there, first of all, pi i j should be equal to pi i j prime, i prime j prime. And I'm going to call, I want to only call one of these redundant, so I will insist that i prime be So, okay, the first thing you need to notice here is that each equivalence class of pairs ij, an equivalence class, I call them equivalent if the permutations are, are equal, and each equivalence class is going to contain exactly one uh, non-redundant element. So, it's pretty clear that it can only contain one value of the first coordinate, and you can't have two different two different pairs with the first coordinate, same first coordinate in the same equivalence class because the resulting permutations, so, so let's say no, uh, i, j is not equivalent to i, j prime if j is not equal to j prime because why? This uh, pi i j the i element of pi i j is j and the i element of pi i j prime is j prime of course. So each equivalence class so by the argument I just gave each equivalence class has only one non-redundant element. Exactly one non-redundant. Okay, so we can reduce the problem to counting the redundant elements. Then each equivalence class will then you can count the non-redundant ones, and each equivalence class has one, so we don't have any equivalence classes there. So can't put this upwards. So um, and now I'm going to try and find k 
characterize redundant elements. So, so let's quickly, maybe I can do this without, no, I have to put this screen down. So, I want to claim that the non the non-redundant elements, or, the, or the, the redundant elements, this is this is a redundant insertion that I have here because it's equivalent to oops, that. So, so what makes this one redundant? How do I know there's going to be something that where the, where I insert an element later and it's equivalent? Well, it turns out, and we're going to prove this, that the the key is that it has to be to the upper left or lower left of a, of a dot that's already in the permutation. If I could do that, I could just flip it over the dot, and then of course we get the same permutation again. And if I have here, flip it over, I'll again get the same permutation. So clearly all of the ones in these positions are going to be redundant. So, okay, how many is that? Eight? So 17, yay, the theorem is true. <laughs> um, that's good, you should always check that the theorem is true right before the talk in case things have changed. <laughs> okay, so now I'm going to do that in symbols. The reason, the reason I'm showing this proof of, of a well-known theorem is I kind of like it, I think there's a chance that we might be able to make it some kind of to automate this for larger co-dimension, I'll say what that means in, as soon as I finish the proof. So there are many proofs of this, uh, but I particularly like this one. I don't claim that it's the proof from the book, but I do like it. Um, okay, so my claim is twofold. Uh, my claim is pi i j or rather, ij is redundant if and only if pi of i equals j, or pi of i equals j minus 1. And we just saw one half of this argument, which is that if pi of i equals j, then pi ij should be equal to, well, I move i over 1. And this, is, this is the case where I insert it below and to the left of a dot. And if, so it's redundant. If pi i equals j minus 1, then pi of i, or, yeah, pi of i j, as, as, again, as we saw before, is equal to pi of i plus 1, j minus 1. Notice, when I subtract 1 from here or add 1, I have to be a little bit worried that maybe, you know, what if I somehow gone off the maximum number that I'm allowed to insert is n plus 1. But here, j is pi of i, so that's at most, so j is at most n, which means this is fine, and similarly this one is j minus 1 is an element of the permutation, so I'm fine. The trickier part, or not really trickier, this is a pretty simple proof, is that what if pi of i is something, what if uh, j is something other than pi of i or pi of i plus 1? then let's look at the i component. So pi ij of oh, the i component of this is clearly j. What about the i component? So if i prime j prime is such that i prime is greater than i, then the i component 
pi i prime j prime sub i. This is the i component of this. And now, it could be just pi of i. That would happen if j prime is uh, greater than pi of i. Or it could be pi of i plus 1. That would happen, so, so it's equal to pi of i if j prime, uh, sorry, if j prime is less than, is greater than pi of i. Yeah. Or greater than pi of i. Or it could be pi of i plus 1 if j prime is less than or equal to pi of i. So this, this case is where inserting the new element actually bumped up the i element one higher. And so that's why the i element of this is one higher than it used to be. OK, but either way, it's in this set. And j is not. So, so, so j is in, is not in pi by. One and uh, pi i prime j prime i is so they're not equal, and that means the permutations are not the same. So pi i j is not equal to any permutation that I get by inserting later. So i j is not redundant. OK, I proved the claim. And now it follows from the claim. Therefore, there are 2n redundant pairs. Two possibilities for each i, from 1 through n. Of course, if i is n plus 1, this pi by doesn't make any sense. So those pairs are never redundant. So there are 2n redundant pairs. And n squared plus 2n plus 1 minus 2n equals n squared plus 1. So that's the number of non-redundant pairs. And so we're OK. So this is a nice answer in some sense. The it tells you how many ways there are to insert an element into a permutation, and it didn't really matter what the permutation was. Of course, the ways of inserting it were different. It depended on pi of i, but the redundant ways depended on pi of i, but it didn't really affect how many there were, and that situation is about to change, and this is what makes the problem interesting and hard. So, Let's, instead of inserting one element, let's insert two elements. And I started out smaller so that it doesn't get too small on the screen. But here's a permutation, 1, 3, 2. And I've inserted an element at 1, 3, which results in this permutation. And then I'll insert another element at, I guess, 3, 5. OK, I result, this results in this permutation. OK, let's do this again. I'll insert an element at 2, 1, and another one at uh, 5, 2, and get this permutation. And as before, we got the same permutation. But this time, things were significantly, like the second blue element was inserted pretty far away from the first blue element, right? So, so things have clearly gotten more complicated. In the previous situation, the red, when the red element flipped back and forth across a dot, it was pretty clear the connection between those two insertions. But here, the blue element moves quite a long way. And it can get worse. <laughs> um, so, the, so, this is, so the number of inserted elements is called the co-dimension of this permutation relative to the original permutation. And once again, in the language, in the language of permutations avoiding patterns, we're counting permutations of size n plus 2 avoiding a particular pattern of size. So, okay, I think I may be out of slides. Yes, I'm out of slides. <laughs> so, I just didn't want to draw all these dots. Um, so what progress has been made with the 
question of enumerating permutations of a given codimension and given a pattern. Well, codimension 2 has been done, and that's by Ray and West. And so for, for uh, codimension 1, we had a formula which was n squared plus 1, and it was good for any permutation. For codimension 2, it's not quite as nice, or depending on your point of view, if you're if you are a mathematician who likes solving problems, maybe it's nicer because it's more interesting. Codimension 2 has the following formula. The number of permutations uh, containing pi, which is in Sn. Codimension is a nice word. It sounds it's a big word, but really we just mean an asset list. Is one half n to the fourth plus two n cubed plus n squared plus four n plus four minus two j, <coughs> where j is between zero and n plus one, and j depends on pi. So let's let's see. Let's try an example. Suppose pi is in S1. It's the one permutation in S1. Uh, how many permutations in S3 contain the permutation one? Well, all of them. So okay, one plus two plus one is four. Plus four plus four that's another eight. So that we've gotten to twelve. And so divide that by two and you get six. So j must be zero. Which makes sense because it has to be between zero and zero. Um, <laughs> but in general, it will depend on, on pi. And actually, um, if n is greater than or equal to five, there's a permutation that produces each value of j. So, all, so all you actually so this this part is not a weakness in the theorem of Ray and West. It's not like they couldn't prove the exact formula. You actually you actually. Okay, and their paper is 30 pages. It's really, really dense. So we go from proof that I could do on about two blackboards to a proof that requires 30 pages. And um, Ray and West are pretty sharp, and I'm pretty sure if they saw a way to extend their method to codimension 3, they would have. But I believe pretty much nothing is known about codimension 3. Um, I will describe a few results that. that so what, what I'm going to do now is go into my results, which, it, which are valid for higher codimensions, but you only get to look at a very, very restricted subset of permutations. So while uh, Ray and West are, have this result for all permutations with some error, we get exact results, but only for a few special permutations, which I'm now going to describe. Not that restricted. It's infinite fun fun. Okay, there are infinitely many of the permutations, or arbitra an arbitrarily large number of the permutations, but they are, if you pick a random permutation of high codimension, it is extremely likely not to be one of these. And, and I'll show you what they are. So, before I do that, uh, let me make a definition. So, so this is a standard definition. So the direct sum of two permutations, pi and pi prime, uh, is, and I'm not going to write out the definition, I'm just going to show it to you. You put pi here, and you put pi prime here. So in the permutation diagram, just put one there and stick the other one out. You could, if you're thinking about them as sequences of numbers, you add the length of pi h. Okay. So we're going to look at permutations that are the direct sum of themselves many times. So, so I'm going to 
So a repeating permutation is one of the form uh, tau plus tau plus tau plus tau. And there could be any number of these. This is what? Um, yeah, so we should really say a repeating permutation of tau or something like that. Because in, under this definition, every permutation is a repeating permutation. As we'll see, the result will only hold once you, the results that I proved have only, only hold eventually for sufficiently many repetitions. And sufficiently many is always going to be bigger than one. It's going to depend on the size of tau effect. So, when, so really I'm defining a family of permutations for tau, the repeating permutations of tau. What's the simplest family of repeating permutations? So the simplest permutation is 1, so the increasing permutations. So example, increasing permutations. Let me put this down. So these are just to direct sum of one. They are all on the main diagonal here. And it happens that we know everything there is to know, essentially, about co-dimension R in, for increasing permutations. And so this is because there is a combinatorial interpretation of permutations that contain an increasing pattern based on Young, Young diagrams, Young tableau. And Maybe if I have extra time at the end, I will talk about that a little. But for now, let's just say this: the increasing permutations, we already know what there is to know about these. And so for each, well, I shouldn't say we know what there is to know about these, but we know how to produce a formula for each R. There exists a polynomial P. I'll call, I'll say P1, later I will put any permutation here, P1 R of N, that which gives permutations, the number of permutations containing 1 to the uh, n of length plus n. Okay, and we can produce this polynomial. That's my, one of my top papers is over. I mean, it, we're not the first to do this, I think. But we can, we can produce the polynomials and based on Gessel's determinant formula. And we went up to r equals 30. I think that's the highest we got. So. But, but of course, could go further. It's just based on computation. So these polynomials let us calculate, for example, the number of permutations containing the increasing pattern of length a Google of length a Google plus 30. It's a big number. It's <laughs> <laughs> not as big as the one avoiding. Right. It's not as big <laughs> as the number avoiding them, because this grows polynomially, whereas the total number grows like n factorial. So there are any Google factorial is a lot bigger than C of them. So it's much, 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 much easier to count the ones containing it. Not just because we have a method for doing it, but also because it's the number. Okay. Now let's talk about other other repeating patterns. So the so the simplest other repeating pattern other than the increasing pattern is uh, two one uh, to the I will actually write two one to the k to correspond with the notation I used in the, the dissertation um, and of course we could pick any. We could, we could do one to the k, but that would just be 